I did with Sills and Crofts was as a producer and a guitarist. And uh, we were able to get into some areas that weren't just purely commercial. They're still beautiful music, but they were, uh, they were, they had, they had a lot of, I thought they had a lot of uh, creativity and uh, uh, lyrically, I thought Jimmy Seals was one of the best writers, and musically, I thought a lot of his uh, musical ideas were were really interesting. Um, uh, as they know, I mean, as a lot of people might know, one of their big, their first really big hit was Summer Breeze, which is... <laughs> Over the period of 12 years, when you listen to those albums, there's a lot of really intricate uh, musical stuff there, and we use the absolute best musicians from sure. Jeff Picaro and Jim Gordon and David Page and all the guys from Toto, uh, all the guys from the Motown sessions. As a matter of fact, uh, Summer Breeze was recorded at the Sound Factory where I'd worked on all the Motown sessions because Sills and Crofts were a bit folky, and I wanted to get a bit more feel into their music. Oh. So I used that engineer, and I used the bass player from the Motown stuff, and, and the drummers from some of those things. Who, who was that bass player? Wilton Felder, oh. who is actually the sax player from the Jazz Crusaders. Mm -hmm. But because he's such a great reader, Motown had him playing all their bass charts, because he could play it better than anyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, when they wrote, when they wrote, obviously they're great songwriters, but they were not such great guitar players. I would assume you were the ones that came. You were the one that came up no, with they, all those. No, they they played a lot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but did you come up with that riff? Uh, the, the, that in it. Yeah. That was yours. Yeah. Is your yeah. name on the uh, credits? Uh, oh yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. is it? Yeah. Okay, great. But I I wasn't playing the whole. I was just. Uh, <laughs> Had that kind of sound okay. going. I wasn't, you know. Uh, I mean, we'd obviously overdub, you know, I'd do acoustic part, a simple part, then the first time. So, yeah, great. Uh, just, I was doing that as a person percussive thing over it as well. So you could maybe do, have done as many as ten parts? Oh yeah, yeah. Of course now with Pro Tools, you know, yeah. we, we, we approach a lot of the stuff differently because yeah. you don't have to just do it from, from, one, from beginning to end all in one piece now. Mm -hmm. uh, it used to be, with analog tape it was so hard uh, editing, you know, in the old days. Like when we would stack vocals, uh, because we only had 24 tracks, uh, we would maybe do eight tracks of backing vocals and then mix them down to two tracks on a two-track machine. And then we have to cue up the two-track and fly them all back into two tracks of the 24. But you had it was real tricky. You had to mark the tape where to push the button so they would come in at the right time. Now we don't have to do that, you know. With our digital stuff, it's, it's so easy for that kind of stuff. Once you started producing yourself, did your view of guitar playing change? Uh, I don't know if it really changed, but uh, uh, I know as a producer, uh, I I would bring in other guitar players, uh, and Lee Rittenauer was my favorite because his rhythm. And, and, and the stuff that he would come in and add uh, was stuff I wouldn't have to mess with or worry about later. It was so good. So uh, from that standpoint, uh, as a producer, I guess I was like other producers. I, I had my favorites sure. that, that I knew would deliver you know, what we needed on, on the particular record. But for the most part, I did play most of the guitar on all my productions and still do. What advice would you have for young people, young guitar players coming up that, that will want to get to get in, involved? Uh, well, I, I, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but I feel that 
whatever they're going to do, wherever they're going to go musically, especially uh, with rock or jazz, uh, they need to have a good blues bass because I think that that makes their jazz and rock better. Uh -huh. And if you look at all of the great players, Jimi Hendrix, I saw him play at the Hollywood Bowl. 90% I mean, of the show was great blues. Mm -hmm. Uh, Eric Clapton, all of the early cream stuff was great blues. Jimmy Page, uh, Jeff Beck, they all listened to the early American blues players. Uh, I remember when I discovered B.B. King, man, uh, you know. And in those days, we didn't have we didn't have strings that you could bend, you know. Uh, uh, like it. <laughs> But, I mean, uh, it didn't take guys long to figure out that if you're going to do that, you need to put the s slinky strings on. Mm -hmm. But uh, the musical ideas that came from listening to those blues players, uh, I think wherever you get to as a musician, if you're working off of that kind of a, a base or foundation, uh, for, to me it sounds better. I mean, I think if you went to a music uh, conservatorium or whatever, you never heard the blues, you just learned the notes off the paper and what they're teaching. When you played, I think the listener would miss something. I, I feel that's my own. Because I think all the jazz, great jazz players started there and, and, and built on that. It's blues soul, music. you know, it, it, it's, it's the soul factor in the music. With the internet now, I mean, if you if you go on YouTube, you're seeing guitar players from all over the world just incredibly gifted and guys that have worked out really intricate stuff and new stuff. Uh, that you know, the Tommy Emanuel and the Tommy Emanuel one of these and uh, uh, all of the gypsy jazz now that's I mean I felt like Twenty years ago, I was the only guy that knew Django Reinhardt ever existed. <laughs> now, there's a whole culture of guys wanting to do the gypsy jazz uh, and all of the different uh, hammering and, and, you know, all, all of the uh, stuff that you're seeing. Uh, it's, it's taken it to a, uh, uh, a place to where you can't really define it anymore. I mean, you'll see a, a player on there that's all... Uh, you know, his he's got his bag of whatever it is he does, and he's great at it. Uh, but I don't know. Uh, you know, I mean that's great for so especially a solo performer mm -hmm. in the studio. Of course, I don't even know if that situation exists anymore, where you need to be a versatile player. It certainly was where I came in because. Uh, as you know, in L.A. in those days, sessions were three hours long, and you might have a 10 a.m., say, with the Jackson 5, and then you might have one session at another studio starting over there. It might be the Mamas and Papas, and, and then you might have a 7 p.m. with Glenn Campbell. So you've got Motown, Mamas and Papas, kind of soft rock, and then you've got Glenn Campbell country. So. If you can't play all of that and not sound like you're imitating playing that, but really playing it, you know, uh, that uh, it, it was it was something that really helped me, and it was something that was really lacking when I when I arrived as a player, because most of the players that had solidified their position as session players, they couldn't go from one thing to the other. Half of them didn't wouldn't even put slinky strings on. You know, you'd have jazz guys that were great for, you know, certain things and reading TV cues, but if you actually tried to put them on a rock and roll record, it sounded real stiff. And um, I was, uh, I was asked after my first session with the Partridge family, David Cassidy asked me if I knew someone other than the older player. I won't mention his name. That was uh, <laughs> that. That I might be able to call as a second player uh, to their session. I said, "Yeah," because I had met Larry Carlton, and I got Larry on that, and we did all of the rest up. 
And shortly after that, Dane Parks arrived, and then Lee Rittenauer, and these are all guys that had that versatility. I don't care what you needed, yeah, uh, if it was country, R&B, rock, you know, Motown, they could all do it. But before that, I found the, I found the guys that were holding down the number one spot very limited in their versatility. Okay. Yeah, they could do one thing great. You, you know. get them off that. Yeah. But, uh, so, uh, to me, that was sort of, a, I think, that, that was sort of a turning point. Because, I mean, Barney Kessel, one of my favorite guitar players, jazz guitar players, uh, but you wouldn't want Barney on a rock day. And when I arrived in LA, LA he was doing Sonny and Cher, Phil Spector rhythm parts, you know, but it was just, it was that kind of stuff with seven guitars. But, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I've I've shown up on session on Motown sessions with there was Joe Pass one day, uh Al Hendrickson, jazz guitar oh. player, uh even Lorendo Alameda one day. Oh. Because some of the contractors they knew these guys were famous, but they didn't know that well, it wouldn't be appropriate to call them for a Motown session. But because they had the name, the contractor that called them, you know, chose them and Often it was a very uncomfortable situation because it just didn't work out, you know, didn't work out. And it wouldn't because they play what they do great and, and they won't compromise either, you know. They <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, and I would imagine they'd, be, they'd have strong opinions about playing too. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it'd be a, a real misfit, but it happened. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because there wasn't that group of guys they were around, they were all, all across America, because I met a lot of great guitar players before I got to L.A. They just weren't sitting in L.A. waiting for session work.